Hi guys, it's John and Jackie of OpenLove101.com. Welcome to our show. We have a very special guest today. Her name is Jessica Fern, and this is her book, Polysecure. She's a psychotherapist, public speaker, and trauma and relationship expert. In her international private practice, Jessica works with individuals, couples, and people in multi-partner relationships who no longer want to be limited by their reactive patterns, cultural conditioning, insecure attachment styles, and past traumas, helping them to embody new possibilities in life and love. And you can learn more about Jessica at jessicafern.com. Jessica, welcome to our show. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, Jackie and I really do. We love your book. Uh, Jackie and I have been in uh, open relationships really since we've been together. And it's mm -hmm. a little over 10 years now. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And, you know, I... I realize that it really doesn't make any difference how long you've been doing this. You can still <laughs> <laughs> you can still hit roadblocks, and that's one reason why I really love your book. And I don't even know how many times I've read it, and it's it's just you know what do they say when you read something you retain like ten percent of what you're reading. So right. I'm I'm hoping I'm up to like the halfway point with your book. <laughs> <laughs> so I can actually apply some of this stuff. I'm so excited to talk to you though about this because I think you bring up so many points that oftentimes we don't even realize is an issue that we have and we want to maybe project it onto something else instead mm -hmm. of looking internally. So I can't wait to dig into some of this. But before we do, I really want to hear, one of my favorite things is to find out about other people's stories. So can yeah. you tell us a little bit about, about you and your history? Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> 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 I mean, very broad strokes. You know, I grew up in New York City. Um, I grew up pretty poor with mostly a single mom. And there was a lot of family issues all over the place. So that I think really sparked the psychology interest. Like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> you know? And because I could see there's these people I love that are good people acting really poorly, right? So it was like trying to make sense of all of this, trying to make sense of my own experiences and tons of attachment ruptures all along the way. So yeah, I think that really like propelled me into studying psychology and spirituality and mindfulness and self-help and just all of it. Yeah. So was, was consensual non-monogamy, how was that introduced into your life? Yeah. In, in different ways, you know, like it wasn't at all conscious, but at 14, I realized, oh, I'm not straight. You know, so it had these little like multiple people kissing make out things, you know, and it was like it wasn't monogamous. right? <laughs> and yet the word polyamory wasn't even in consciousness, you know, for anyone that I knew. Um, or like, you know, my uncle was classic hippie, like at Woodstock and my his wife, my aunt always had someone on the side. But like we didn't t call it anything. It just was what was, you know, was. so in adolescence. I had a lot of forms of non-monogamy without knowing that that's what it was. But then at like, you know, late twenties got married and <laughs> was going to have a, a monogamous marriage. Right. And, um, it was really, um, a few years into that, that we opened up to full on polyamory. Yeah. Did you start off in your marriage as, as being monogamous? We did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. We, I think we had emotional non-exclusivity. There was always space for us to have intimate emotional connections with other people, especially opposite sex people. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, we were sexually ex exclusive initially and monogamy in that form was assumed. Yeah. And then did you go from monogamy into to some other form of consensual non-monogamy? We, we jump, jumped straight into polyamory. Really? Okay. <laughs> There was no easing in. Yeah. And of course, you know, like I found someone within a few months and, and, you know, like fell in love, like really hard. So, I mean, it was, it was a big shock, I think to both of us. And it was, for me, it was also a huge liberation. It felt like, cause as I was reading about it and learning about it, I was like, this is who I am. Like, this is who I've always been. 
you know, in many ways, I feel like it is who my first husband is as well, but you know, there is a lot of conditioning and attachment stuff and codependency within our marriage that like made that opening up really hard. And was that difficult for both of you in different ways? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas he struggled more with the insecure attachment um, with me, like suddenly arising, feeling secure, and then suddenly feeling insecure and having a lot of panic, primal panic, a lot of jealousy. I didn't have that his way, you know, I've noticed, oh, my disorganized attachments coming up with new people, you know, or like traumas that never come, came up before with my stepmom or coming up with my metamors, right? Because <laughs> that parallel never got activated in monogamy. You know, or with my hus- first husband, it would be what I call justice jealousy, where the things I was asking him for, for years, monogamous, and I just had to eventually be like, that's just not him. Suddenly now he's like giving to somebody else. <laughs> like, oh. you know? so, right. It wasn't jealousy like, oh, I don't want you to be with that person or I'm jealous that you're spending time in a possessive way. It was like oh, how could I have been asking for this thing and you just weren't capable of it? And now you suddenly have this capacity for somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. So that we had struggles all over the map. (laughs) (laughs) And and yet we did get to a place where I think we were doing it pretty well. When you first got into it, I mean, you're using terms like, you know, attachment and so forth. Were you were you thinking that way at that time? Or did you? Great you, question. Yeah. I mean, it was before my book was written. I was thinking of it in that term because, you know, even just like Psych 101 had sort of, you know, in college had like the attachment styles for parenting. So I started to think about it in those terms then. Yeah. That's very interesting. So when you, yeah. when you, when you talk about attachment styles in a relationship, is this... <laughs> is this something that you learned or is this something that you cultivated? Like as far as those attachment styles, because you talk a lot about it in your book. Yeah. And those aren't things I came up with, right? That's like sort of, you know, attachment theory was created by John Bowlby and and the researcher, Mary Ainsworth, you know, in the sixties. Yeah. So, you know, I was building upon that theory and applying it to non-monogamy. Well, cause, and I find it really interesting because in your book, you talk about how we can have, you know, kind of a, a secure attachment in our monogamous relationship because that monogamy kind of helps, um, helps us feel secure yeah. you know, because of the parameters of what monogamy means to us by our own definition. And when we open up the relationship, it can then kind of introduce more of an insecure because those things now we feel like are, are kind of missing. Can you talk a little bit about the Absolutely. attachment styles? <laughs> Cause it's so yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. how you can feel like you're just rolling along really smooth. And then all of a sudden you're like, what is happening? Right. Yeah. And so what you're touching on is, is um, how the structure of monogamy makes us feel secure, you know, like, Oh, we live together, all those structural elements. We share finances, we share car payments, maybe we have kids, maybe we own property. You know, these are huge commitments and structures and the legality of something like marriage, you know, and the public persona as a couple, right? None of that's to be underestimated. And then when we open up, we don't, those structures don't have the same meaning and we can't rely on them as much in the same way. And so for some people, the change can just, make them realize, oh, I really never felt secure. It was just this whole monogamy idea that was helping me feel secure, you know, and I have my own insecure attachment style that I need to look at. Sometimes we did feel secure with our partner, but things change so much and we start acting differently as partners, you know, and we start unintentionally hurting each other, that that creates a lot of insecurity, you know, or we realize, oh, this whole time we weren't actually relationally secure. I didn't feel safe with you. I didn't feel like I could truly share my feelings with you. I felt secure though, because I knew we were married and you're not going to leave, right? <laughs> or it's really going to be hard to leave, you know? Um, I know at the end of the day what your address is, you know? 
So, but, but maybe the way we've been showing up for each other hasn't really been the best, you know, so that gets exposed too because, because of the way non-monogamy is. Yeah. So how does someone become aware that they have an, an attachment style? Yeah, great. I mean, we all have different attachment styles, you know, so the research um, lays out four of them. So one is secure, which the basic premise is I'm comfortable within myself and I can be alone and I care about you and miss you. And then I'm really comfortable with being close and, and being intimate. I can do both togetherness and separateness, you know, and people who are secure might still feel insecure, right? But they're able to have the ability to say, oh, I'm going to talk about it with you. I'm going to name my insecurity, right? Instead of act it out. The insecure styles tend to be someone who's more avoidant or withdrawn. And they kind of, they'll still be in relationship, but when stuff gets hard or they're fe feeling overwhelmed or you want a little bit more intimacy than I want, they're going to pull away, right? And their tendency is to do an avoidant or dismissive is what it's called. The other end of that is people who are like leaning in too heavily and they're grasping onto their partner, you know, and they're hyper-focused on their partner and what they're getting, what they're not getting. What's my partner doing? Looking at my phone. Where is my partner? <laughs> you know, <like> all, <laughs> where's your location, right? <laughs> all of that hyper-vigilance, right? And then what's called the fearful withdrawn or disorganized kind of vacillates between the two. And so, of course, there's many tests online. People can, you know, figure out their attachment style. In my book, I offer many different prompts, you know, that people can sort of identify how are you showing up. And what we see is that we usually don't typically show up the same way with every relationship. Or sometimes even with the same partner, it changes. You know, And that was a huge eye opener for me with my therapy clients, I would start to say, oh, wow, you're really secure with this partner and you're really anxious with this one. That's hard. <laughs> right? Oh wow, yeah. Right. Or suddenly you've always been more anxious, but you have a more um, anxious partner now and you're acting more withdrawn. Right. So it's, it, there's an interaction that happens too. Right. Or if we have a partner that is more anchored in being secure, it can help us feel more secure as well. Well, and what I like about what I like about your book is it it just keeps returning to personal responsibility because yeah. I I know when when we do our coaching a lot of times and and even just in our own relationship you know it's much more fun for me to project the problem onto John right. you know, this is right. really your, your problem <laughs> like, I'm okay you're the one that has the problem you know, so it you know when when we're talking to couples. Oftentimes, you know, I feel as though their their goal is for us to fix their partner and then everything will be OK. And what I yeah. like about your book is that it really helps people feel safe to look at themselves, you know, like it, mm -hmm. it actually provides tools that they can work with and use to to grow internally so that they can kind of reach that that safe space while making these transitions because it it is a it is a big deal when you've gone from m monogamy and you decide well we're going to open up the relationship and we're going to introduce swinging or poly or, or whatever it is and you talk about this too in the book about you know you come into that relationship with all these all these lessons that you've been taught and now you're going to turn that on its head and exactly. it it does feel very um discombobulating. I mean, you do feel like what in the heck is wrong with me? You know, like this is something I want to do, but I'm struggling with it. Why am I struggling with it? Maybe I shouldn't do it. But you say, yeah. no, that's not, that's not what we should do. So what right. should we do when we feel exactly. those things? Right. Is, is see it as an opportunity, right? Okay. Whether it's, it's okay, there's attachment stuff coming up or, oh, this is my monogamous conditioning. You know, like how many of us have been conditioned that your partner with someone else is the worst thing that could happen in your relationship. I mean, that's the right. Cheating is one of the worst things that could happen. So now we're like, wait, OK, but now my partner with someone else is the most beautiful thing that can happen in our relationship. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. You know, like, OK, like 
Yeah. Right. And like you're saying, even if it is, I want this, it can still be that lingering monogamous, you know, conditioning that we have to undo. And, and then there's stuff within the relationship, you know, that like, oh yeah. in monogamy, we got to sort of not deal with some of these issues. (laughs) We got to like tolerate them or sweep them under the rug or they weren't as bad you know, and now in non-monogamy, we can't like avoid some of our stuff in the same way we, some people are able to. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I feel like that seems to be kind of that issue that a lot of couples have. They're going along great in the relationship. They switch it up and now all of a sudden there's all these problems and they automatically want to blame whatever it is they're trying to transition into instead of, you know, maybe this is something going on with us. How do they yeah, Let's this is exactly what my next book is about, where I say, Yay. you know, <laughs> couples are transitioning. I literally, this is in the introduction. And, you know, everyone then is like, oh, if they want to blame it on non-monogamy. So just go back to monogamy. And it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's usually not what solves it, right? Or makes it go away. And so some of it is just, oh, we didn't have the skills for this new paradigm of relationship. It actually requires us to have higher level of skills with communication, time management, emotional intelligence, courage to speak up sooner <laughs> and have an uncomfortable conversation, then sort of avoid it. And now I've like, there's real hurt that's happened, right? These are a lot of things that people didn't necessarily even consider when they thought, oh, great, it's going to be fun to have more sexual partners or to have more falling in love in my life, right? So there's this conversion issue that happens, right? And then it is, we start to get introduced or we're now embracing the non-monogamous concepts around something, let's say, like non-possessiveness of your partner. And now you're reflecting differently and going, oh, yeah, you've been entitled to me in a lot of ways that actually don't feel good. (laughs) (laughs) But that entitlement in monogamy was maybe romantic, right? Right. But now in non-monogamy, that same kind of entitlement to each other is possessiveness, right? So like, so all of it's getting shaken up, right? And it's going to usually causes, um, what I say is non-monogamy, it will force differentiation in partners which ultimately is healthy, but a phase of differentiation usually sucks because for the first time you're saying, this is who I am, which might be different than you. (laughs) I haven't been saying no, and now I'm going to start saying no, and it's hard. Yeah. No, I mean, and that's exactly what we see happen, you know, and, and it, and it's, you know, to a degree, it's really scary, you know, for, for these couples because they're like what are we doing we're messing up our relationship right we're damaging our relationship we're damaging yeah. our relationship but you're saying not ne- that's not necessarily the case actually you may be doing yourselves a, a great benefit because you're going to get in touch more with yourself so how how do you reassure couples and kind of what's that process for them how do they know if what they're you know how do they know if what they're doing is creating growth or if it's just creating more destruction What does that look like? It's a great question. I mean, some of it is I'll give a larger context, like, okay, you're in the storm and it's hard and giving them the framework of like, what is differentiation in a partnership and what's needed, you know, and what things are destructive that are not that like um, the four horsemen from Gottman's research, you know, like if you're doing criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling and contempt, that's causing damage, right? You know, if, if you're breaking agreements, you know, if you're saying yes to things to your partner and then not following through with it and not taking responsibility, you know, that's just damage period, monogamous or non-monogamous, right? Um, Which is different than you know, we're having hard conversations in ways we've never had before. I need maybe more space from you than I've ever needed before. Oh, I'm having new ex- sexual experiences and realizing there's certain things we've been doing I never really liked. We got to figure this out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, right? Like, yeah, there's ways you've been touching me that weren't for me. They were more for you. And I'm pissed about it, you know, but that's a diff, like we can work through those things, even if they're hard. 
you know, which is different than identifying forms of abuse or mistreatment or neglect, because that gets revealed a lot too is relationship neglect is, oh, I've actually been taking you for granted for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, we're taking this relationship for granted. And now there's new people and they give me all the dopamine and, you know, oxytocin with the new relationship energy. And I'm hyper fixated on them, you know. Yeah, well, and that that kind of brings up another issue. And you you spoke about it briefly when you were talking about, you know, some of the changes. And one of those is time. You know, so if you've got someone that, you you know, you kind of get fixated on them, how, where is that balance? What does that balance look like? Yeah. And so, you know, the way we're framing this conversation, because I think it's what your experience, right, was like, is you're in, are you two in primary partnership? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if we're talking about it from that, the couple that's opening up, right. Um, It's really getting clear on like, what does this relationship need? How much time to feel like we're, it's like the investment is make sense mm-hmm. you know, that I'm getting enough with you to feel like I'm fulfilled in this relationship and being realistic, you know, six days a week, probably not realistic if you want to be m- non-monogamous, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. But how many nights a week do we need for our connection to feel really healthy, you know, so that it doesn't feel like it's completely taking away, you know, but there is, we, if we're going to let other people in our lives, they deserve time too. And we do have to give up the time of our partner and it's hard. So then I think focusing on the quality when we are together, what's the quality of our time. And that's going to be exponentially harder for couples that live together and have kids or share a business. Cause a lot of your time gets, I call it the domestic soup. You know, it's like, it's like really depolarizing and, and, you know, like it's not quality time. Usually, you know, it's not romantic time. Right. And everyone else is getting this romantic version of you. They get the easy, fun, you know, lit up, inspired version of you. And I get sort of the tired, frustrated (laughs) in the middle of every day version of you. So it's sort of making sure that the relationship that has more nesting or entwinement is getting some of that quality of time. That's a really good point. It, it brings back a yeah. memory of when, um, when my first wife and I, we had shared custody of our children. Yeah. And when my children would come to me, we would do fun things together because I didn't right. have them as much. They really lived with their mom. And I used to hear from her sometimes, you know, the, you have to be more disciplinary. You know, the kids, the only time that they're with you, they just get this fun time. I have to be the jerk with them. And it really comes down to that. The the, the time, you know, it, it would have really probably been on her to find time to have the good times with the kids too. It doesn't always have to be yeah. just that disciplinary, controlling, go to school, those types of things that we put upon our children. Right. Right. But it's hard when you're like, yeah, I've got to like make sure the homework's done and the lunches are packed and there's laundry and there's, you know, like driving our kids everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to pivot into, okay, let's go have an adventure, you know, and the same thing happens with our domestic partners. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and how we define time, because we've had this conversation yeah. too, you know, it's, it's what we think our partner or we're doing with the time that we have. You know, right. if if John's going to go play golf, he doesn't play golf. But if he went and played <laughs> golf for five hours, it wouldn't have the same impact on me as if he was going and spending five hours with somebody. Like, I'm going to view those things differently. With a girl. With a girl. Not with somebody, yeah. You know, so, go to dinner, or go out or whatever. So how right. do we break that cycle of, of placing value on what our partner's doing when, you know, if it's not going to bother me that he's playing golf, well, why is it bothering me that he's doing, you know, going out with a girl? Well, it obviously huh. has something to do with what I'm thinking is going to be happening or. So. Right. Exactly. Or this idea that like our love and attention is a finite resource, you know, and if you're giving it to someone else then I'm getting less. Right. right? And there's some, like, it's not true and true at the same time, right? Like love is infinite. And I definitely see in non-monogamy that when I experience more love with this partner, I come home and have more love for my 
nesting partner, you know? Yeah. But yeah, if I'm giving five hours on Saturday to that partner, you didn't see me those five hours. <laughs> like, it's just, <laughs> that is true, right? The time is finite. And so it's right. And I, I like what you're pointing to is our idea. We think that like, oh, they're having the best, most amazing sex and the best conversations and like they're getting everything I'm not. Right. You know? So again, if we feel like, okay, I'm, this relationship is getting what it needs, right? That's what matters. And to switch that focus there, like, oh, this isn't about you with them as much as like, how are we? And, I'm, and, and what do we need to feel like we're growing and like expressing ourselves as our best version of this relationship? Oh, I like that. And I really like what you said too. And I've, I've experienced it as well, you know, after being with someone for a couple of hours, even if it's not, um, even if it's just an, an open relationship, just a, hanging out with someone then coming home. I definitely have more love for Jackie in those experiences, especially right yeah. after. It just feels like my love with her has grown through those experiences. And then okay. there are times where she's had a boyfriend and the same thing happens with me. I, I just get so excited about her and her new relationship. And uh, I can't wait to hear about what happened with her and her friend. And so it really, the times we have had uh, those kind of relationships going on at the same times, it just seems like for me, our love my love for her and our relationship really grows. Yeah. And what is yeah. that? What, what is, why do we feel yeah, that? Why, where does that come from? It's a great question. I mean, I feel like it's like that saying the tide rises all the boats, you know, it's sort of like as our love is, is growing <laughs> and like all the relationships of our life are enhanced. You I'm know? totally stealing that. That's a great that. analogy. I yeah. love yeah, yeah. that. <laughs> I didn't raise that analogy. Of <laughs> yeah, right. And, you know, literally last night, someone said to me, they're like, from their outside of their marriage relationship, they're like, my cup is getting so filled in that relationship that I'm showing up as a better husband to my wife. I'm like able to support her in a way I think I never have before. You know, and sometimes it's that we're learning new concepts with those new people. We're learning, you know, new ways of being attuned or empathic or just, you know, less defensive. Um, and we can now show up in a different way. Mm. Or just, yeah, we feel good. <laughs> you, know? you know, and that's what I love about that analogy is that you picture abundance. Yeah. You know, yeah. that abundance yeah. goes across the board and that's what you're saying. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I've realized in my own journey that monogamy creates kind of a different message. And so it's, it's even about deconstructing that kind of yeah. scarcity or exactly. being on guard to just being at peace or at ease or, um, you know, just making your world bigger by expanding who you are by coming in contact with all of these people. And so it's, it can be kind of frustrating. I think sometimes for those of us that have, you know, really walked that monogamous path hard, even yeah. as much as we want to open it up, can, sometimes it can be like Jiminy crickets. You know, it's, it's about completely switching our thought patterns to, to like this abundance. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And then, and it's beautiful, right? So the positive is, oh, there's all this love, right? There's more good feeling hormones running through my body regularly, right? I'm having better sex usually. Like there's more emotional support, you know, I can tune in, lean into that partner if this one's not available, right? It's, it's amazing, you know? And then we have abundance issues too. <laughs> like, like, oh, I'm now I had, there's problems of abundance too, right? Like there's more to manage, right? <laughs> Well, this is true. Yeah. Yes. Right. Whether it's, I mean, the time piece is an obvious one, you know, or this happened to me this week. So with my partner outside of my house, we had like a relationship rupture and we were repairing it. So I was just, you know, I was pretty, both of us were taxed. Right. And then I'm in the car with my husband and he starts to talk about like new advancements potentially with someone else. And there was a moment in my own head that I was like, I just can't deal with it in this moment. <laughs> like it's too much, you know, like I'm already really dealing with this other, you know, and then I regulated myself and was like, what he's telling me is 
awesome. And I just, I'm going to celebrate that and not focus on like myself being overtaxed. Yeah. So, and, and not to, not to just like go back to attachment styles, but I, you know, I find it so interesting. So if, if, if we have these different attachment styles, let's say in a, in a relationship and how do we, what are ways that we can look at what we're doing from a, a more objective standpoint? So yeah. you, because our tendency I think is to always be biased to, towards our own storyline or, you know, we create, um, yeah. you know, reasons why we act like we do. And then we can be very blaming on our partner or why they're doing what they're doing. So how do we know, um, you know, if, if we come up against an issue that we're dealing with that issue from a more secure attachment and not an insecure attachment, you know, if, totally. if we're talking about um, what, whatever it is. Yeah, totally. It's a great question. There's probably a lot of ways to answer it. I mean, one is, you know, knowing what is my tendency, is it to pull back and do the withdraw? you know, or minimize and dismiss, right? Or is it to lean and grasp, right? And sort of then saying, in some ways, it's doing the opposite. Like, oh, if I'm, my tendency is to withdraw, then how do I just lean in a little bit more, you know, and listen a little more or reveal a little bit more of myself, you know, and that would be the process, right? If my tendency is to like pounce or like lean, um, hypervigilant and it's like, okay, that's really learning how to self-regulate more. How do I lean back? So I actually can hear what my partner's saying, you know, and not have this heavy filter of my own experience, you know, so that would be one way. Also it, and this takes time, but really being able to distinguish like how much of this is my own past, you know, am I getting triggered about old wounds, old traumas, and how much of this is present moment. And what's confusing is sometimes it's both, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just you're getting triggered from your past. It's like, yeah, your, your partner actually wasn't honest. <laughs> and right. so it's triggering all of the traumas of dishonesty you've gone through, but like, how do you deal with just this present moment rupture that needs attention, you know, and not be reacting from all of the past? Right. Yeah. And yeah. when someone realizes that they've got an attachment issue, I mean, is yeah. it best to seek professional help or? Yeah, I think so. Or, you know, seek out resources to read or listen to that are helping you to like work through your attachment stuff. Absolutely. I mean, it's a gift to yourself. I think that's just so incredible, you know, to work through your own attachment, early childhood history and then often our, we could have had a great early childhood attachment history, but our adult attachment relationships could have been where we're having the insecurity come up, you know, or a lot of people are acting um, in way, they're calling it polyamory, but it's something else. They're really not acting in integrity or in consideration to the people they're dating, right? And that causes a lot of attachment pain. Um, so yeah, first, you know, working with someone or working with resources to like, heal your own heart, so to speak, you know, an, an attachment system. And then what does this relationship need? You know, because it's not just our own stuff, right? Like there can be stuff that's absolutely relational, you know, like, yeah, a lot of times you don't pick up on my emotional bids, right? <laughs> You're not really available to me emotionally. Like that's not just me. <laughs> that's, that's a relational thing that needs to get worked through. Yeah, so it's really both. When um, when you see, so, you know, I'm very similar. I have a similar story. When I was very young in my teens, I realized I didn't have a name for what I was, but I was like you. I mean, I played with multiple people. I didn't, I wasn't really in committed relationships and it was really free. And it wasn't until uh, really much later in life, I went to a club in Amsterdam and I'm like, oh my God, this is what I am. And there was right. a name for it, you know, and so for me, being this way all my life, and then to be with someone like Jacqueline, that for most of her adult life was in a very strict, uh, religious, monogamous style relationship, very, you know, in a box, so yeah. to speak. And then when she decided she wanted to come out and try something new, 
Do you do you experience that often with couples where they come from two different places like that? Absolutely. And, and how do you yeah. see them coming together in in like what would you recommend to couples like that to be able to get to a point to where they can be whatever they want to be? Right, right. So the person in your role would be like, okay, slow down a little. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's usually what's needed, you yes. know, is like this, like we can and sort of mapping out okay, where are we now and where are we headed? So you don't feel like, oh, we're just sort of not moving forward at all, right? Or we're only at her pace and we're never going to move beyond that, right? But then for you, Jackie, you not feel like, oh, I have to like stretch to the point of breaking because like I can't keep up with his pace yet, you know? Yeah, so it's it's articulating your why is a big thing. Like, why do I want to do this? Why do we want to do this? I think that's a really important sort of like the lighthouse, <laughs> yeah. you know, of, of that you can keep coming back to that helps guiding you, you know, and then, and then, yeah, pacing out how we're going to do this, you know, cause I've never had a couple tell me like, yeah, we just, we went too slow. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah. Right. right. Like, I hear one person say it's too slow for yeah. me and that can be really hard, you know, yeah. but often it's, um, you know, this went way too fast and now there's damage we don't know how to deal with, you know, but you're bringing up a great point too, is sort of the religious conditioning. So not just like mainstream monogamous conditioning that we've all grown up with, let's say in the West, you know, but the hardcore religious, you know, conditioning, that this isn't just like, what you're supposed to do culturally this is like what god says you're supposed to do and you're a sinner if you do otherwise and right. like and usually there's a lot of sex shame and body shame that's also entwined with that yeah right yeah we definitely see that's one of the most difficult challenges for couples or one of the one of the partners in the in the couple that is dealing with or has dealt with that kind of shame and and yeah. guilt and not being able to move through it, you know, it definitely can cause triggers in those couples as well. They can be going through something and then, and then in the middle of whatever they're doing, the, the here God appears and, you know, someone's running scared and getting upset with themselves. And we see that totally. often. Yeah, totally. Right. So as, as partners to be more like trauma informed, right. Or like historically informed about each other to know, like we're each deconstructing different things you know, and, and it could be very different because for some people, like maybe like you, it was just easy. This is how I was. And it started this way when I was young and that's it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing that I'm noticing, you know, just in the, in the decade that John and I've been together and, and while we've been talking about this and, and the research that I've been doing is, is just that path that you have to kind of take. And so, you know, when you've got couples that are trying to move forward into this, other than reading your book, which is amazing, everybody, I mean, don't, don't let the title like get in the way of what this message is. Cause some people mm -hmm. might be like, well, I don't want to be Polly, but no, that doesn't, that's not what this is about. This is about anytime you're wanting, not even just opening up your relationship, but getting in tune with how much conversation or connection you're not having with your partner totally and, right. or, or or yourself so right. you've you've got a couple and they say we've had a conversation we want to open up a relationship so what are what does that look like to you i mean what would you tell them are the first five things they need to do or the first three things they need to do right I don't know if I have it listed out, but in that first conversation, you know, I would, I would say, okay, great. Why? You know, I'd want to understand that motivation, you know, um, is it because one or both of you feels like this is who I am and this is my orientation. That's really important. Or it's for philosophical reasons, or it's something I want to experiment, or I've been having trouble being faithful. And so I don't want to lie anymore. You know, like, why are you doing this yeah. is really important. Yeah. Well, and that takes a high degree of transparency and vulnerability to yes. even have that conversation. Totally. And then in that just initial where it's going to get revealed of like, 
do you even have the level of safety to have that conversation? So if that conversation, you know, safety, emotional safety isn't there yet. Okay. That's, that's like an emergency, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like deal with this first. There's a lot of that I do see in very new people, you know, of like, okay, there's things here that like a foundation that needs to get either rebuilt or built for the first time to be able to hold a relationship structure that is, does have more complexity, you know, that does require more of each of you. Yeah. We definitely talk about that quite often with couples that we talk to in the, in the the clubs or wherever. It's not about, you know, some couples come to us and they want to fix the relationship that they are currently in and opening up your relationship and involving more people in it, whether it's just sexually or emotionally, isn't always the best, probably is not the best way to fix the problems you have in your relationship. You really have to focus on those first. And Well, and do you, do you feel like consensual non-monogamy is on an upswing? I mean, do you feel like we're changing as a culturally and as a society to something a little more open? I definitely do. Yeah. I don't think non-monogamy is on the upswing. I think people have been doing (laughs) non-monogamy as long as there's been people and, you know, and varying degrees of openness, you know, I mean, the rates of cheating are astronomical. So you're like, actually the majority of people are not monogamous, (laughs) whether they, they just might be presenting that way. So I think what we're seeing is a change in that is people aren't presenting purely as monogamous in any more in the same way. And people are having more permission. Yeah. And what yeah. do you think that stems from that kind of honest level of? Yeah, I think it's all the sort of, you know, movements that have happened over the last 30, 40 years. I mean, we can go back to women's rights movement and what birth control did and then LGBTQ mm-hmm. movements. I mean, this has really paved the way. You know, and in those movements, there's a lot of non-monogamy that happens, you know. So as I think we've seen in the last few decades, a lot of these, um, you know, social expectations have been deconstructed. Well, monogamy is going to eventually get its turn. What do you think that's going to take? Because there is still so much. I mean, we, John and I, we have people that we've come across with like, don't tell anybody, you know, we're going to invite you to our house, but don't tell anybody what you do. Or we've had right. businesses not want to do business with us because of what we do. So, like, and then we have people that are in the lifestyle, like, "Oh, I can't tell anybody that I do this." I'm like, "Well, how are we gonna? How are we gonna change this if we can't even stand up totally. for what it well, is that we do?" It. I mean, right? Is is more and more as people just talk about it and talk about it plainly and talk about it as a valid, viable way to be in relationship, you know. And start to challenge again, like <laughs> cheating rates are really off the charts, you know? So like, what's, what's this about? <laughs> you know? And this is a healthy relationship, right? That's exactly. the other thing that, that people are wanting to be open, transparent, honest, you know, and, and wanting to be in healthy relationships. Yeah. So I think the more and more there's, you know, podcasts, books, TV shows, it helps you know, and people sharing not just the disaster stories, but, you know, the beautiful stories. Well, and I know that you have a workbook that's yes. coming out with this, that, that people can go ahead and they can pre-order those. That's going to be out yeah. in November, right? It's the workbook for the PolySecure. I'm so excited for that to come out. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it parallels the book. You know, so the first part is really looking at your own attachment, (laughs) nothing to do with whether you're non-monogamous, monogamous, monogamous, you know, in relationships, single, you know, which everybody should know, right? (laughs) Everybody (laughs) should know their attachment style. It's important. Really looking at, right. Your own attachment history, who were your attachment figures, you know, the tendencies that you have. Um, And working through that with different prompts and exercises and boundaries and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, and then looking at, okay, within non-monogamy, you know, which styles do I tend to want? What have been my experiences? What would a safe haven or secure base 
mean and look like to me? And then really, you know, the third part of the book goes through the hearts method, right? And so just, you know, adding more and more to, to doing all of those things how to do the hearts even better than what, you know, the first book gave. Right. And, and who would, who would need this workbook? Like if they're describe what they're going through that they would, you would say, yeah, you should get this workbook. It might help you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think anyone who's already doing non-monogamy and has experienced struggles with relationship escalations, de-escalations, you know, relationship endings, their own insecurity and attachment stuff coming up. It's like, yeah, this is going to support your own healing. This is going to support, but I do actually, I have couples that are like, we're pretty good. We just want to actually continue to up level and like be more preventative (laughs) than doing damage control. And that's incredible. So yeah, anyone who wants to deepen their connection with themselves and feel more secure internally, as well as do that in relationship. And when is that going to be available? I think November. November. November yeah. okay. And you can, and like I said, like on Amazon, you can pre-order it. Okay. So. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. I am so thrilled that you have agreed to be on the show with us. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you are just such a well of knowledge with this. And really, I know for me, it just helped me immensely. And it, you know, I mean, it was kind of hard. You know, I think sometimes it's hard to admit like, oh, shoot. I have yeah. this thing. I need to kind of pay attention to myself. And so it can, even though it can be difficult, it may be a fantastic gift to yourself because it's yeah. growth, right? Yeah. I mean, you get to learn something about yourself. You get to be a, a an even better version of yourself than you were. And I just, I, you really explain it very well in the book. And I'm so glad that you had the courage to do it and come out yeah. with the book and, and put it out there to really, to really help people. So I, I can't thank you enough for being on here and visiting with us and sharing your knowledge. And I know I can't wait for the workbook. I can't wait for your next book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, That's awesome. And I mentioned that you can find uh, Jessica at jessicafern.com. Is there anything else you want to tell our audience about Jessica before we move on? If if people subscribe to my website, they'll get notifications. If I open my practice or I'm offering a course or the new book is coming out. Yeah, I don't send a lot out, but it's a way for people to stay connected to anything I'm offering. Okay. But I do know I've been on her site and she has a lot of oh, yeah, classes. And, yeah. cl- and I mean, they're really informational. Lots of notes, lots of note taking. Yeah. <laughs> so it's right. really great. You could do That's it at good. your own pace. So it's, it's really good. So. Good. Yeah. And for us as well, if you guys want to get our newsletter and uh, sign up at openlove101.com, we'll notify you of upcoming blogs that Jackie's writing or a video like our interview here with Jessica Fern when it's coming out. And you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, and like us on our YouTube channel. Ta-da. <laughs> Thanks again, Jessica, for <laughs> being with again, us. Thanks again, Jessica. <laughs> All, right, All right. Thank you. See you guys. Bye, yeah. everyone. Hey, baby. Did you like those videos? No? If you did, subscribe below and you'll see plenty more. Yeah!